This video is brought to you by the TLDR socials. Get more from TLDR by following us on Instagram and Twitter where we post explainers that never make it to YouTube. The link is in the description below. It's been a tumultuous couple of years for Italy, with economic and political struggles only exacerbated by the pandemic. Things have somewhat stabilised recently thanks to the success of Super Mario Draghi's premiership and coalition government. But with the Italian presidential election beginning yesterday and Draghi the current frontrunner, concerns that a political crisis is just round the corner are on the rise. So in this video we'll take a look at how the election works and whether Draghi could end up in the Quirinale. So before we get into the results, a bit of context. Italy's president is a mostly ceremonial position, which usually involves signing bills into law and performing diplomatic duties. But in times of crisis, which are pretty common in Italian politics, the president becomes more important, because they're in charge of dissolving parliament and forming new governments. Essentially, the president is politically important because they're in charge of steadying the ship. Anyway, the president is elected every seven years by the members of the parliament and a handful of regional representatives. At the moment, there are 630 elected deputies from Italy's lower house, 315 senators from Italy's upper house, plus six senators for life, and 58 regional representatives, three from each of Italy's 20 regions apart from the Auster Valley, which only gets one. We say at the moment because these numbers will be reduced after the next general election, which is due in 2023. This is due to a constitutional referendum held in September 2020, which confirmed the reduction of the number of seats from 630 to 400 in the Chamber of Deputies and from 315 to 200 in the Senate. The President is elected via a secret ballot and a two-thirds majority of the total number of electors, including any absentees, is required. If no candidate reaches the two-thirds threshold, then the voting is repeated, and if by the third round no candidate has reached the two-thirds threshold, then on the fourth round the threshold falls to 50%. The last election, won by Sergio Mattarella, was held on February the 3rd, 2015, which means his term runs out on Thursday next week. Mattarella, by the way, was elected on the fourth ballot with 665 votes, having received just four votes in the third round. The first round of voting for the new president was held on Monday, giving the parliament 10 days to agree on a new president. However, it's worth saying that this year's presidential election is more important than most, and this is because of one man, Mario Draghi. For those of you who don't know, Draghi used to be the president of the European Central Bank, where he earned the title of Super Mario, and is currently Italy's Prime Minister. Draghi came into office in February 2021, after the resignation of Giuseppe Conte in January of the same year. At the time, Italy wasn't in good nick, economically or politically. The Italian economy was struggling with Covid, which had caused an 8% recession in 2020, and Italian politicians were bickering and resigning over how to spend the 200 billion euro or so worth of grants and loans from their cut of the EU's recovery plan, causing some concern among EU politicians in Brussels who weren't convinced that Italy would be able to sort itself out. Italy's economic woes were exacerbated by the fact that, before the pandemic, the Italian economy wasn't in great shape either. Italy's economy has essentially stagnated since the introduction of the euro in the late 90s, and southern Italy is now one of the poorest regions in Europe. This is in part due to Italy's remarkably low productivity, which started falling in the early 2000s and has never recovered. This means that in order to maintain high quality public services, Italy has to borrow a lot of money. Its debt-to-GDP ratio has averaged out at about 120% since the 90s, well above that of, say, France or Germany. Not only that, but Italy also has high borrowing costs, which is what you'd expect given the state of its economy and its already high levels of debt. Historically, Italy has had to pay about 1.5% more on its 10-year bonds than Germany, significantly more than other European countries like Spain or Portugal. There wasn't much optimism when it came to Italian politics either, which has always been a bit crazy. No one knows quite why, although political scientists often cite Italy's use of a proportional representative electoral system and the fact that Italians are more willing than most to move between political parties. 
Of the 945 deputies and senators elected in the 2018 general election, 147 had changed parties by the end of 2020. But the fact remains that Italian politics is uniquely chaotic. Italy is currently on its 69th government since the Second World War, and its 20th since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The, the average modern Italian government lasts just 18 months. For context, in the same period, Germany had 9 governments, the UK had 12, and France had 16, if we're counting major reshuffles. Unsurprisingly then, when Conte resigned, there wasn't much hope that a stable government would be formed. Anyway, that's the point. At a time of crisis, both Italy's economy and its politicians were failing it. This is where Draghi comes in. Largely thanks to his impressive reputation for competence and sky-high approval ratings, which have hovered around 65%, Draghi was able to form a coalition including all but one of Italy's large political parties, from both the left and the right. This unity has been remarkably successful, presiding over an impressive vaccine rollout and making a good start on the necessary reforms and investments for the EU Recovery Fund. This is particularly important because the Recovery Fund is the first time that the EU have agreed to debt sharing, something that would very much benefit the Italians by making their borrowing a lot cheaper. But Draghi has since apparently decided he wants the presidency. While he never explicitly said he wants the job, he didn't deny it either. And in December, Draghi gave a speech describing himself as a grandfather of Italian politics, which was widely read as implying that he'd be open to the presidency. This has created a bit of anxiety in Italian politics, because if Draghi becomes the president, he'll have to give up his post as prime minister, and there's not really anyone else who'd be able to unite such a disparate range of parties. Italian politics would be at risk of collapsing back into its default state of chaos, and necessary economic reform would be up in the air again, possibly threatening the prospect of any future EU debt sharing. It's also possible that, if Draghi loses, he'll struggle to continue to keep the current coalition together. Anyway, Draghi's victory was seen as a pretty likely outcome, largely because the two other potential candidates, incumbent Sergio Mattarella and former Prime Minister Sergio Berlusconi have both ruled themselves out of the running. Going into the election, the bookies had Draghi as firm favourite, with his odds at about 45%. So what happened on Monday? Well, the first round of voting was inconclusive. This was somewhat unsurprising. Most of the main parties told their MPs to leave their ballots blank so that they could continue negotiations between themselves. No one knows what happens next, and while Draghi might be the favourite, Italian presidential elections are uniquely unpredictable, prone to dizzying swings and backroom deals. But what do you think? Will Draghi come out on top and become Italy's new president? And if he does, will political chaos follow in his wake? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified so you don't miss the results of this election when it concludes. And if you want to be updated live as the story breaks, then make sure you're following us on Twitter and Instagram. We've got accounts for all of our channels, where you can find exclusive content and explainers that never make it to YouTube. And, of course, we really appreciate your support. Special thanks to our Patreon backers for making videos just like this possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos just like these people, then be sure to back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description below.